I got it. Right. Roger.
Make sure your questions are fully in line with where they're supposed to be. If not, you and I can have a discussion privately. Okay? At this time, y'all stay seated. Our dignitaries will come in, and then we're going to get rolling. Okay?
Please be seated. The students, uh, welcome. Welcome. Let's give uh, ROTC a hand. Um, I'd like to also welcome, we have ROTC from seven, diff seven different schools here. Welcome to Farragut High School. As I told some of you yesterday, I got to meet uh, some heroes, and two of them are in front of, you, in front of you today. Before I turn it over to Heather Haley, for, as she is the MC for our event, I do need to recognize a few people here today. Uh, some of our town uh, aldermen and mayor, uh, our county commissioner, and uh, some of our representatives. So let's do that real quick. Alderman Drew Burnett, Vice Mayor Louise Pavlin, Mayor Ron Williams, Town of Farragut Town Manager David Smoke, uh, County Commissioner John Shoemaker, State Rep Jason Zachary, State Senator uh, Becky Duncan Massey, and then State Senator Senator Briggs. Welcome uh, to Farragut High School. I don't want to steal anybody's thunder or get into their story. Um, it is the honor of a lifetime to share a stage with two Medal of Honor winners. This is the highest, the highest decoration um, award given to anybody in our nation for their bravery on the battlefield. I, I said earlier to you that so far it's just been men. I am positive the first woman Medal of Honor winner is coming. And, and it will be, if you will notice, it will be men of all color, races, coming from all parts of our country uh, that have earned this, this award, received, they received this award. Uh, once again, I want to turn it over to Heather Haley from WVLT, as she's the honor, um, she's the MC for the event. And uh, guys, please pay attention. What you learned today, uh, put it in your heart. Keep it, hold it precious, uh, because it will guide you the rest of your life. Heather. Good morning. As you mentioned, I'm Heather Haley. Actually, it's kind of cool. I'm back on the stage. Last time I was on this stage was when we were doing Cinderella in musical theater class here at Farragut. So it's a little different. The, the lights aren't as bright right now, but honestly, it's an even, even better story to tell today. Um, we've actually had the honor of telling all sorts of stories on WVLT about the Medal of Honor recipients. I think the most fascinating part to me was when I learned that they were not obeying orders. Can you imagine how Dr. Bartlett would react if you were disobeying what you're supposed to do? You were not likely to get an, a, an award for it, a medal for it, right? But this is a special kind of situation. So they went above and beyond against what they were supposed to do, expected to do, to do some amazing and extraordinary things. So the stories you hear today really are almost mind-blowing. I'll admit, I'll probably will tear up. I'm one of those people. Um, but I think this is a fabulous opportunity to just kind of listen and absorb, like Dr. Bartlett said. They have so many amazing tips, even that can apply to so many facets of our lives. Sorry, there's three different microphones here. I don't mean to ping them all on you. But I want to give them the opportunity to tell their story. So we're actually going to start with Michael Fitzmorris. Uh, now, when he earned the Medal of Honor, he was a specialist fourth class. He went on to actually earn his highest rank of tech, technical sergeant in the Air National Guard. And he earned this award during the Vietnam War um, in 1971. So I wanna give him the opportunity to go ahead and speak. Would you like to come up here? You want me to come to you? Good morning, everybody. What, what a great day. Gary and I get to spend time with you, and then we, they threw in a helicopter ride, which is always a great way to start the day. 
60 years ago, probably Gary and I were both sitting right where you guys are, wondering what we were going to do with our lives. I knew I didn't want to go to college, so I went and joined the, the military, in the Army actually. Went to Vietnam in 70, 71. And now it's your turn. You guys are going to be the future. And we want our country back, so get in there and get her done. I don't know what. No. no okay. I, I'm going I'm to put you on the spot then. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your story, whatever you're willing to share from that day? What, what it was the, the moment, the experience that you had that brought you this? Yeah, you go, go right up. Absolutely. Sorry about that. I, I don't do this very often. Well, it was 1971. I had just turned 21, and two weeks later, they blew me up. So we was, I only had like two months left in country, and they said we're going out to Quezon. That's They were going into Laos at the end of the, and they said it's good duty, you're just going to guard the airstrip. So here I am, I went out on, on guard duty. I, I think we got done about about two in the morning. I trucked back to our our bunker where we slept. I think there was probably four to six guys in there, and I no more got in than the the rockets and mortars and stuff started coming in. So I was already dressed, and my buddy Phil, I think he was next on guard. So we. We ran out to the fighting home. When I came out the door, if it wouldn't have been for Phil, I wouldn't even be here because there was five sappers and he shot them up and we got to our, our bunker. And then, from then, I don't know, they said, a, I don't know, how, how many is in a company? About 300. That's what they said there was, a company of sappers and you have to understand these guys there, well, I guess actually almost what you'd call suicide bombers nowadays, but they were highly trained and we had the wire and, and they were slithered under. So all the time I was on guard duty, they must have been coming under, under the wire. And then they come in and they the few that come under there blow the wire and the rest of them can run in. So we're in the fighting hall fighting and I seen a guy come up, up to, we were in trenches, they're all connected together, about neck high, so I look out and here come somebody up this trench, I thought, well, that's got to be one of ours. And about that time he throws a grenade in. I threw two out, and then the, the third one I couldn't get, so I just covered him up, and, and then just kept on going. I got banged up pretty good. But in the end, we all came out okay. Phil was with me. He got wounded. I got wounded, and the... The guys in the bunker, they threw a charge in there and buried them. And I got medevac, Phil got medevac, and so for 30 years, we didn't know. I didn't know if Phil was alive or he didn't know if I was, and we didn't know about the guys in the bunker. So we finally had a a second of 17 cab reunion and we got there and here's Phil and Bill and Billy I guess Phil received a purple heart in Vietnam and he he threw it in the trash can 
But Billy had picked it up and he kept it for 30 years and gave it back to him at this reunion. And then, I don't know, I think it was uh, probably eight, ten years ago now, Billy committed suicide and my buddy Phil had a freak accident, cut himself and got gangrene and he died. So I'm the only musketeer left. But thank you for listening. grenades and he's just jumping right in. I don't think that would be my reaction to be completely honest. Definitely braver than I. Um, I was talking to Gary Luttrell before this and you know, he, I think he's got some great points too that are going to help us all realize what we can learn from the Medal of Honor. Obviously you don't, obviously we have some awesome students that are hopefully will be future members of our military up top right now with uh, seven different schools represented here from ROTC. That's fabulous. I'm sure you guys are taking in different lessons than maybe I would, maybe the other students here would, but there's something in it for everybody. Um, so I want to turn it over to Gary Luttrell, also served in the Vietnam War, was Sergeant First Class in the Army when he received the Medal of Honor and earned the highest rank of Command Sergeant Major. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your story, sir, but I know that you have some really wonderful lessons, the points of the Medal of Honor that you would like to share with us all. Thank you, Heather. Mikey forgot to say, so I will. Uh, Mikey and I received our awards at the same time. Uh, we received our award from President Nixon. And for you people on or about my age or a little bit younger, you know, our award was in between Watergate and goodbye. And Nixon had more, more fish to fry that day than Mikey and I. You know, he come in, presented our awards, shook our hand, muttered something, and out the door he went. And a couple of weeks later, we seen him waving goodbye on the helicopter. So it was exciting that Mikey and I got to, uh, got to meet President Nixon before he, before he took off. I'm going uh, to make my story real, real short. Um, if you want to know more about my action, just, just Google uh, CSM, which stands for Command Sergeant Major Gary Luttrell, and you can read my citation. But I'll give you a short version of it uh, because actually it's a boring citation. I um, I got uh, I got orders to take my Vietnamese Ranger Battalion. I was an advisor. I didn't serve with the American unit. I was an advisor with a uh, Vietnamese uh, Ranger Battalion, and we had another which is now a Medal of Honor recipient, he passed away this past December, was in a Special Forces base camp that got overrun. And most of them were dead or wounded. Uh, Gary Bykirk was um, the medic in that camp. He received the Medal of Honor for the action also. But they were overrun, and I, had a, I was an advisor with the Vietnamese Ranger Battalion, which consisted of 473 Vietnamese Rangers four advisors. So we was going to, uh, our mission was to penetrate uh, their compound that had been overrun, set up a defensive uh, position and get the dead and wounded evacuated. I got one hilltop short and um, darkness caught us and uh, we didn't move in Vietnam at night. And the enemy that was attacked in Gary, which consisted of roughly 5,000 North Vietnamese uh, hardcore fighters, 66th NVA Regiment, the 29th NVA Regiment, and the K-6 Sapper Battalion. And they just threw a horseshoe around my, my hill and started pounding on us. But uh, I had the high ground. Um, I had artillery. I had air support. So we beat them down. It took us four days and four nights. At the end of that four days and four nights, I, uh, out of the 473 Vietnamese, I had 41 walking wounded left. And out of the four advisors, it was me. And the ones that um, survived um, thought that during those four days, I, I went above and beyond the call of duty. 
Uh, I didn't. I was doing my job. I was a sergeant first class. And, uh, you know, I was just doing my job. But I was awarded the Medal of Honor for it. So, but if you want to read the citation, just Google Gary Luttrell and you can read it. Now, I want to talk to you about you and your character development. Who are you? And that's a question that I want you to ask yourself. I want all of you today to look in the mirror and ask the question, who am I? Who am I? Am I a person of character? And let's talk about the six core values of the Medal of Honor and how you can apply that to you. Those six core values, courage, commitment, sacrifice, and the most important word in the English language, integrity, citizenship, and patriotism. Those are the core values of the Medal of Honor. But each of you can apply these core values to your life every day. So let's talk a little bit about those. Let's take the first one, courage. You know, you look at courage and say, okay, that's a soldier, a sailor, uh, a, a Gary Luttrell, a Mikey Fitzmaurice that went into combat and done heroic thing. No, no. Courage. Courage. To you, it's doing the right thing under adverse conditions. It might not be popular, but it's the right thing to do. And you don't take the easy way out. You do the right thing under adverse conditions. And let's take an example of that. Stand up to a bully. You see someone being bullied. And you walk up to that person. And I'm going to tell you, you can do it without worried about being beat up. It's the approach that you take. But do you have the courage to walk up to that bully and say, excuse me, why are you bullying this person? Wouldn't you feel better giving someone a helping hand, someone less fortunate than you? Give them a hand up instead of bullying them. Now that takes courage, doesn't it? But that's who you are. I want you to look in the mirror and ask yourself, who am I? Am I a person of courage? Can I do the right thing under adverse condition? You know, you often wonder, how are you perceived by the person to your right and left? How are you perceived by your parents and your teachers and your congressperson? But most important of all, you look in that mirror, how are you perceived by that image looking back at you? That's important. That's important. You're on this earth for a very short time. Be honorable. Be courageous. Do the right thing under adverse condition. Commitment. If you commit to something, as soon as times get a little difficult, don't say, oh, I quit. I quit. No, be committed. You go and fulfill your mission. Let me give you an example of that. Okay? How many people love football? Everybody loves football, right? Let's take that right tackle, right guard. Yeah, he loves football. It'd be better, big as he is. He's big enough to go grizzly bear hunting with a willow switch. So, but, you know, let's take that right tackle, right guard. What's their job? Their job is to protect that quarterback, right? Protect that quarterback. We got two minutes left in the game. 38 to nothing. Are we going to win this game? No. But are we going to quit? If we quit, if that right tackle and right guard, if they quit, that quarterback gets hurt. Be committed. Go all the way. If you say, I'm going to do it, 
die trying. Sacrifice. Are you willing to sacrifice your comfort for those less fortunate than you? Look in the mirror. Ask yourself, who am I? Now I want to talk about the most important word in your English language. To me, it is. And I think it should be to you. The word integrity. Without integrity, ladies and gentlemen, you are a body without a soul. Without integrity. And what is that? You don't lie. You don't steal. And you don't cheat. Look in the mirror. Who am I? Am I a liar? Am I a thief? Do I cheat? How do you want to be perceived by yourself? You know, the first time you tell a lie, it's difficult. Second time you tell a lie, it's easier. Third time you tell a lie, it becomes second nature. Pretty soon, what are you? A liar. How are you perceived by the person to your right and left? He's a liar. You can't believe a word he says. Do you take something that doesn't belong to you? You know how you can test a thief? What do you do when nobody's looking? Huh? Think about that. Nobody's looking. Oh, look at here what I found. Uh, nobody's looking. Uh, stick that in my pocket. Well, guess what? Look in the mirror. What looks back at you? A thief. That's cheat. It's real easy, I understand, from my grandkids now. It's real easy to cheat during this computer age. Okay? Is cheating easy? You think about it. Who are you cheating? Are you cheating the person to your right and left? Are you cheating your teachers? Your parents? No. If you cheat, who are you cheating? You're cheating yourself. Look in the mirror. What looks back at you? A cheater. Character. Start building your character now at an early age. At an early age. I didn't start until I was 19 years old. Or excuse me, 17 years old. That was the day I joined the Army. I come from a very, very dysfunctional family. I didn't have any parental guidance at all. My first parental guidance was from my platoon sergeant who shined the toe of his boot with my butt. That was the parental guidance that I got. But I realized when I was 19 years old and I was a sergeant in the United States Army that I had to build my character if I was going to be a leader of troops. And I recall back on the six values of the medal. Courage, commitment, sacrifice, integrity, citizenship, and patriotism. Each of you look in the mirror today. Look in the mirror. Next time you go to the restroom, look in the mirror. Ask yourself, who am I? And openly admit your weaknesses and work on them. Be proud of what you see. Don't worry about what the people on your right and left think of you. Don't worry about what your teachers and your parents think of you. That's important, but it's not the most important. What the most important is that image looking back at you. Thanks of you. Be proud of you. Do the right thing when times are hard. Now, we got a whole lot of time. And I was told we can stay up here until I think it's 1130. 
That's a whole hour from now. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go into question and answer. Sound like fun? Here's the ground rules, though. We don't talk religion, and we don't talk politics. They're totally, totally off the table, okay? We start talking politics, and you find out how I really feel in my heart. 50% of you is going to love me. 50% of you are going to hate me, and I won't be loved by all of you. So no politics, okay? Other than that, we don't have to answer to anyone. He has to answer to Patty, his wife. I don't have to answer to anyone. My wife passed away three months ago, so I don't have to answer to anyone anymore, okay? So I can answer any question Understanding, it's our opinion. Now, don't make it fact. That makes it our opinion. We can talk about the military. We can talk about anything at all except religion and politics. And we're going to give you the answer to the best of our ability. So let's start this. Do we have a floating microphone, sir? Why don't we just use this one and, and we can talk behind the uh, podium. And now, address it to Mikey or me, okay, and or to both of us when you ask your question. Start thinking some good ones. If you don't, I'm going to I'm point and call you out, okay? You answer, ask me a question, okay? Start thinking. Okay. Why you joined the military? Because it, it was, I mean, there was a lot of stuff there, right? Because it was Vietnam. Uh, it was, when you joined the military, you knew what was going to happen. You knew where you're going. It, it wasn't a secret. Um, what, what inside you said, hey, I want to serve in that way? I knew I wasn't college material, and most of my family had served so there's where I got the harebrained idea. I'm going to go join the military. Myself and three classmates went down, signed up, and when I got home, my dad was mad. <laughs> but it all worked out. I joined before Vietnam. I was uh, a Sergeant D5 before I heard the word of Vietnam. But as I said earlier, I come from a very dysfunctional family. One of the first things that I can remember as a child, I think I was, I was four years old, was my dad and uncle getting into a knife fight. My dad bled all over the house, the front yard, and fell out in a ditch. You know, and I'm a little kid, and I'm looking down. I said, well, I guess my dad's dead, you know. And so seeing blood never bothered me once I got in the military. Uh, second thing I can remember, I was five years old, and that was looking down into the coffin of my dead mother and little brother that had gotten run over by a car and got killed because my dad, sorry rascal, wasn't there to take care of us. Uh, I lived with various uh, family members uh, off and on and never, uh, never felt that I was, I was wanted, okay? I, I can't remember as a child uh, receiving a hug or... Or, or someone telling me, I love you. And I missed that, okay? I was nine years old. My uncle took me down to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and I watched the 101st Airborne Division jump on out of airplanes. I had no idea people jumped out of airplanes, okay? But I looked up and seen those paratroopers, and I said, that has got to be me. I am going to join the Army as quick as I can. I'm going to be a paratrooper. And I'm going to find out who I am and start building me some character, okay? And so I was 15 years old. Right before my 15th birthday, I was uh, living with my uncle, and I heard him and my brother saying, well, you know, somebody else is going to have to come and get him. We don't want him anymore. You know, it was a little old 
14, almost 15 years old, that, that crushes you, you know? And I'm saying, you know what? I don't need these people. You know, they can kiss my bottom of my foot, <laughs> okay? I'm out of here. I'm out of here. So the next morning, I started hitchhiking from Kentucky to California, and I ended up, my last ride ended up in El Monte, California, close to L.A. And I said, the only thing I had, only thing I owned was a birth certificate that my grandmother gave me. I had a wallet with a birth certificate in it. Sure didn't have any money in it, but I had, I had, I had my birth certificate. I said, I get out to California, nobody knows me from Kentucky. I doctor up my birth certificate and I joined the Army. I did. Got halfway through basic training. Sat on the rifle range. Now, being from Kentucky, I could shoot, okay? I could shoot pretty good. Well, the competition, I'm city slickers from L.A. Now that in L.A., they can shoot good. But back then, they couldn't, okay? <laughs> so we're out on the rifle range, and I hear these sergeants say, man, that kid in the trail can shoot. Yeah. My little old bony chest pooched out. I weighed 132 pounds soaking wet with two bricks in my pocket, okay? My little old bony chest stuck out, and I said, wow, I got me a compliment. Got back to the, to the company area, and the first sergeant come out and he rattled off some instructions of the platoon. I now I need to see Private Luttrell in the orderly room. Whoo, doggy, I'm going to go and get a pat on the back from the first sergeant. I walked in, he looked at me, and he said, Luttrell, how old are you? I knew I was busted. I knew I was, well, I mean, he had no reason to ask that question, right? And I said, I'm 15, but I'm a good soldier. I can stay, can't I? Nope, nope. Gave me a bus ticket and a $10 bill to Los Angeles. And I got off the bus, and I'm, 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 I'm homeless. And what am I going to do? And I'm walking the street, and I see a help wanted sign, auto parts store, Mr. and Mrs. Toy. I walked in to Mr. Toy, looked up at him, and Told him the whole story. You know, I'm here in California from Kentucky. Joined the Army, got caught, got kicked out. I need a job till I turn 17. He said, I'll pay you a dollar and an hour, and there's a room upstairs. So I worked there for two years. On my 17th birthday, I joined the Army. And at that point, I started realizing. I kept telling myself, I was looking in the mirror at that time. And that image looking back at me said, you're going to be somebody someday. You're a nothing. You're a nobody. You are going to be somebody someday. Commit yourself. I joined the Army, and I said, I'm going to be the best soldier. I seen Sergeant Sawyer, young buck sergeant, master parachute wings, U.S. Army Ranger tab. He gave all the classes in the, in, 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 in the platoon. The, the, the staff sergeants, E6s, didn't. That's Sergeant E5 with that ranger tab and that master parachute. I said, I'm going to be a Sergeant Sawyer one day. When I was 19 years old, I was a sergeant with airborne wings on my chest. When I was 21 years old, I got that ranger tab. And I said then, I've got to be the best soldier that I can be. Courage, commitment, sacrifice, integrity, citizenship, and patriotism. And I retired at the highest rank you can as enlisted, which is command sergeant major. Had a wonderful. That's the reason I joined the Army, was to get away from people that didn't like me, didn't want me, and I needed to find a family and find out who I am. So, so I have two more questions. Um, and, and guys, don't miss... Uh, it, you may have gla glanced over it, um, and I don't want to but miss, uh, Tech Sergeant is what you retired as, Tech Sergeant Fitz Maurice, uh, jumped on a hand grenade, if you didn't hear that. You, in, in the Medal of Honor, as you, as you read Medal of Honor citations, there's a lot of Medal of Honor citations, there's somebody jumps on a hand grenade. Most of them are awarded posthumously because the person didn't live. So when this gentleman jumped on a hand grenade, he did so knowing he probably would not see another breath. 
understand, don't miss that part of that story. Talk, talk to me about, talk to the students about what the Medal of Honor, that part, I had two questions, part A and part B, what the Medal of Honor means to you uh, as a recipient. Um, and then the part B is you're, you're now in a convention with 60 some odd other Medal of Honor winners, including uh, two from Korea um, and 19 from Afghanistan and Iraq, including the likes of Dakota Meyer, Kyle Carpenter, Ty Carter, and some of our newest Medal of Honor winners. Talk about what the Medal of Honor means to you, and as you sit in the room uh, with all the other Medal of Honor winners, uh, what comes to mind? Well, when I... It's on, it's on. It's on. <coughs> Excuse me. When I was in basic training, we went to a museum and, and there was a, a Medal of Honor and God, we all, ooh, we're going to get one of those someday. And, and then, as luck would have it, I did and I was out of, actually I was out of the military. I, two years, I went back to the packing house where I worked and was sawing a pigs one day and they called up and said, you got to call in the office. So I went down and I thought, oh man, I'm going to be in trouble here. But here it was the White House said that I would be receiving the medal. And I didn't really know really that much about it. And I thought, yeah, that's going to be all right. But the more you, you look into it, you, you see the, I mean, people sacrifice or for so many years, and in my own case, I, I never figured on surviving it, so really it isn't nothing I'd done. It, but now to be with the other recipients, we're, we're kind of like a big family, and we don't talk about war stories, and it's grandkids, and what you're doing in your life, and it's just great. Different than uh, Mikey. Mikey uh, come back from Vietnam and, and went back into civilian life. Uh, I stayed on active duty. And that, that was difficult because I realized early as a Medal of Honor recipient that all eyes are on me. I have to be perfect 24-7 to live up to the medal. And that was a challenge. It was a challenge. I had to say every day, don't not make a mistake. You know, you hear your troops behind your back. They won't ever say it to your face. My, my sergeant is a Medal of Honor recipient. Man, what he says is gospel. Now try to live up to that. Try to live up to that. You have to think before you speak every time. You have to set that example. You've got to lead from the front. You have to be perfect. And that's what it was like to be a Medal of Honor recipient to me. Now, it's easy being a Medal of Honor recipient because this is basically what I do. I started my own foundation, and the mission of the foundation is to get in front of as many children as I possibly can and talk about the six core values of the medal. Try to change some lives. That's simple. Now, what's it like to go to a convention? Like Mikey says, we don't tell war stories. I don't want to listen to his war story. He don't want to listen to mine. I can care less what he done. I want to listen about Patty. I want to listen about them grandbabies. That's what we, you know, we grew up together. I've known Mikey for 50 years, Okay. We grew up. Mikey is my brother. The 33 recipients, I believe it's 33, that's here at this convention are my brothers. Okay? The brothers that I never have. We look out for each other. We take care of each other. I get a hunting trip in Colorado. Who do I call? Hey, Mikey, you want to go elk hunting in Colorado with me? 
got two slots. Okay? I get a hunting trip. To, I love to hunt. Okay? I love to hunt and fish. You know? I get a hunting trip to Africa. I call Bob Patterson. Hey, Bob, you want to go to Africa, go hunting with me? Got two slots. That's, that's what's it like to be a Medal of Honor recipient. We look out for each other. And if we know that one of them is financially hurting, there's a crisis in their life, they need assistance, we are the first to step up and give assistance to that fellow veteran, our fellow Medal of Honor recipient. That's a good question. Thank you. I've never had that asked before. We have uh, about nine minutes, so if you have a question, I know you had a question. Come on up. You're a hell of a speaker, not much of a knife. If you have a question, right there. We've got a few questions. That's a, we're good. Just a few, but we've got nine minutes, guys, before I've got to get them moving, okay? Hey, guys. That's a great question. My question is for either of you or both of you. Was it hard to go back into civilian life and did you struggle with it at all? Good question. Good question. No, nope, we just came home. You got off the bus. Nobody spoke about Vietnam. Nobody really gave a hoot. And I went back to the packing house and just took up where I had left two or three years earlier and just back to life. Nobody spoke of it. Okay, I, I don't want to speak for myself. I want to speak from the group. They were a group of nine of us that got our medals together um, because President Nixon kindly accumulated them over two to three year period. <laughs> and then presented them all at one time. But we won't go in, that's, uh oh, no politics. Okay, um, but do let, I, I do want to speak for some from that group of nine, okay? And I'll make this quick because I want to get as many questions as possible. Uh, there were three of us, and I'll use three, that come back. I, I stayed on active duty, went about being a soldier, training soldiers. We had one, Kenneth Case, and you can uh, Google him if you want, but not right now. Google him later. Kenneth Kays, K-A-Y-S. To the best of my knowledge, the only recipient to receive the medal in civilian clothes. Kenneth couldn't wear the medal. He couldn't live with it. Kenneth hung himself, put a rope around his neck and hung himself. Okay? Gary Bykirk, one of my closest friends, he passed away this past December. Gary come back, tried to go to college. It was impossible the way Vietnam veterans were treated back then. He literally moved up New York, upper New York, lived in a cave for several years till he met his little wife when he went and made his grocery run one Saturday and she convinced him to, to come out of the cave and they ended up getting married. So it was difficult not only being a Medal of Honor recipient coming back from, from a war, but the Vietnam War was an unpopular war, and it was, it was difficult to come home. I hope that answers your question. Similar question. Yeah. Um, regarding the unpopular war, um, how was it trying to find a new job or, like, new career during that time? Was there trouble trying to uh, get accepted, or were you accepted with open arms? I want to know a little bit more about that. Good question. In the packing house that I worked in, I, I worked there all through high school at night unloading salt trucks. And so then I got into the main plant while I was in high school. And you got what they called rights. So if you had so many months in, I left and you come back and you were guaranteed the same job that you had. But then these folks... Once they thought I was a Vietnam veteran, they were always, you know, bang and stuff, and I'd go nuts. And so it, it's, it's how it is. Well, I stayed on active duty, so I didn't have to adjust. And by the time I retired, the unpopular war was over, the popular war was on, okay? And I had people saying, hey, thank you for your service, okay? Um, 
I, uh, I, I stayed on active duty, lived on base, so I didn't have to put up with those feather merchants that I used to call them names, but now I say people that had views different than mine. See how I've changed in life? I mellowed out, hadn't I? Okay. Had one little incident at a family reunion from one of my little war press and cousins. And, you know, he positioned himself right across from me at, uh, at dinner and, and made a couple of nasty comments. So I had to teach him how to breathe through his ears while his face was face down in the mashed potatoes. And you know what? Didn't have any more problems after that. But uh, three. Okay. We've got about three minutes and I've got rapid fire questions real quick. If you didn't mind. What was your favorite food while you were in the army? Your favorite food? Whatever they put in front of me. In Vietnam, I was an advisor, and I ate off the economy, and ate, ate well. I, I love Vietnamese food. Okay. Question? Uh, first, on behalf of all the ROTCs here, I would like to say thank you for your service. Um, if you had to go back and do it all again under the same circumstances, would you? Certainly would. No doubt. If I had to do it all over again... I'd make a couple of modifications. I might have zigged when I should have zagged. That's about the only change. Yes, sir. Good question. Thanks, Great sir. question. Go ahead. When y'all wanted to join the mil uh, military, did y'all ever think that you would make it this far? When you joined the military, did you ever think you'd make it this far? Or did you ever have the premonition, hey, this is what your future holds? Nope. I had no idea where it was going. I... I was just, I was in pretty good shape, so basic wasn't bad, and that's all I worried about is getting through. I think once I realized that I could be another Sergeant Sawyer, I could be that NCO that was highly respected, uh, you know, I, I knew what I was going to be. My military career was going to be good. My life was going to be good. Okay, the next one is actually about your military occupation. So it, those of you that don't know, when you go in the military, you choose a field. You choose an occupation, a specialist, whether, whatever that is. And so this next one's about that. Did you enjoy the occupation that you had when you went into the military? Your, your occupational field, your MOS? I, was, I don't know what the number is anymore, but I was trained in armored recon. When I got to Vietnam, the 101st had walked in an ambush and lost a bunch of guys, so they picked us, and I was helicopter assault, or whatever they called it then. I was, uh, I was an infantryman, and then I specialized later on after I made sergeant as, a, as an airborne ranger. Guys, uh, I promised this to my students real quickly. Gordon, I'm, we, we are out of time. We'll, I promised this to my students. I'm going to give you guys like 30 seconds. I know this is a big deal. Get your phones out and take a picture. Well, I go down here so they can hear you. Right. I want to take a picture. more commanding than I can be. Would you help me with my kids sometime? Okay, <laughs> just, just curious. I'm going to try that at home. I bet it doesn't work. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. I think you guys had some fabulous questions. I don't know about you, but when I look in the mirror, I think I'm going to take a lot away from that. So thank you very much for sharing everything with us today. Thank you guys for being such wonderful examples of what Farragut can do and be. Again, I'm proud to call this my, my past high school as well. Thank you guys. Gentlemen, we have a couple of hacks. Let me give.